come out for this uh, interesting, uh, sweet, joyful, uplifting movie called Mandy. Um, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists, uh, the director of the film, Panos Cosmatos, producer Josh Waller, and the late Johan Johansson's agent, Kevin Korn. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. So this Hello. is an, an interesting event. Uh, it's a composer crowd. It's, a, it's an SCL screening, but unfortunately the composer is not with us tonight. You haven't seen the film yet or heard the score yet, unless you're a pirate. Uh, so we'll have to talk in vagaries a little bit, but uh, there's still a lot to, to dig into uh, as far as setting up the film and talking about your experience working with Johan. Um, it's an interesting swan song for for a composer it's a a bloody swan song it's a it's a bold swan song but i i think it's kind of a fantastic showcase for for his uh sensibilities and kind of a great last statement and i i want to get into that but let's start at the beginning um with the film do you remember the exact moment or the exact circumstances when you came up with the idea for mandy uh, yeah, I, I, I don't remember the exact moment of Genesis, but uh, I was writing my first film, Beyond the Black Rainbow, and that I was trying to process some grief that I was going through, but that whole film is very much about sort of containing your emotions and like everything being controlled, and I think uh, unconsciously as like a survival instinct or something, I started to think of this other idea, which is all about ex you know ex uh, expressing your emotions in an outward primal kind of way, and I think I lo looking back on it now, I realize I was doing that in order to have something that I could work on that would allow me to like express that part of myself and not just sort of writing Black Rainbow was like a really claustrophobic kind of trying experience. So I think I, I, I unconsciously wanted to be able to express something more uh, like the polar opposite of that, you know, like like an antidote to it. Do you feel better now? No. <laughs> <laughs> you tried. What what took it took so eight <clears throat> eight years about from that original idea or maybe a little more? What what took it this long to kind of come to fruition? Well, I mean, at first I went and made Black Rainbow because it seemed like it was a doable thing. It was on a smaller scale. Um, I, I I thought I could pull it off. Uh, whereas in a completely like isolated uh, situation. Uh, and Mandy, you know, it's 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 on it's a much bigger scale film to my first one, so I I, I thought it would be impossible to, to to do that right off the bat alone. So uh, once Black Rainbow is completely done and out and, and completely off my radar, then I went back to writing on uh, Mandy, and uh, we, I finished a draft with my friend and uh, Aaron, and uh, then. Uh, Spectre Vision came on board, and then it was basically just waiting for uh, the, the planets to align, where we had a situation where we could make the movie the way we wanted to. We had an adequate amount of money to do it, and uh, you know, it just took a long time for those things to line up. It's so you. It's it's a process of grief. It's a. It's an, in some ways an exorcism of of something personal, mm -hmm. but it's also this collage sort of love letter to all these sort of references and mm -hmm. movies and art and music from the past. Was that, was that just inherent to the way of expressing those emotions for you? Or uh, you know, what, what's, what was your thinking behind it being like that? Yeah, I, I mean, in, in a way, I think it's a kind of a joyful film for me, you know, and definitely compared to Black Rainbow, which is very controlled aesthetically and tonally. I felt because this film was like the antidote to that, that, it, that I felt freer to sort of express, uh, you know, humor and, 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 and some other stuff like that in a more outward way, whereas it seemed uh, somewhat inappropriate to the other film. So, and they were both driven by this idea, you know, uh, uh, of, of trying to create like an imaginary film because after my father died, I started uh, thinking back on my youth and like, the things that made me happy in my life and where my life was going. And I kept on thinking about being in a video store uh, that was called Video Attic. And uh, I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies, so I would look at the VHS box covers and read the weird, lurid descriptions and then imagine like a completely non-existent film based on those things. 
And years later, I read this thing. It was an interview with uh, Kurt Cobain, weirdly, where he talked about growing up in like small town uh, Washington, and he, uh, he, 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 there was, he had plenty of access to heavy metal, but he had no access to punk rock. But he had access to magazines that would describe punk rock. So he would listen to descriptions of this music, read descriptions of this music he'd never heard, and then listen to heavy metal and kind of imagine what he thought punk sounded like. And I and it feels like that might, was like a huge, if you look at it, like a huge part of generating his sort of vision of what music was. And I think there's something to be said for like imagining what something is as opposed to what it's supposed to be, you know? Yeah. Well, having seen the film, that connects a lot of dots. So Spectre Vision. What what made you in, you know, attracted to this and think it was uh, worth doing? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, initially it was that we saw Beyond the Black Rainbow, and um, my partners and I just said like we have to track down this filmmaker and and uh, tell them you know that we're willing to do anything possible to make their next film, no matter what it is. You know, we just we just felt that you know by watching Black Rainbow, we were we were witnessing you know a, a voice that <laughs> needed to be supported, and uh, and that and so th yeah that that's literally how it started. And then we stalked him a little bit, and uh, uh, met up Elijah and Dan met with him, and uh, then it was kind of off to the races. I think we were talking about something else, and then you brought up Mandy or. Was it? Yeah, it was. It was always. It was always Mandy. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. Just like bang, 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 and then it happened. And once we were together, then it was just a matter of like Panos said, like waiting for the planets to align. You know, try to find you know the right actor, the right everything. It was not not an easy pitch, you know, to people. I don't understand why. It's yeah, <laughs> it's a sweet story about how far a man will go for the girl of his dreams. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, so let's talk about music. Um, before we get to Johan, I, I was curious, because your, your dad made some very, uh, you know, classic 80s films with some great scores. Mm -hmm. Did that sh influence your uh, thinking about what kind of score uh, works or the kind of, you know, it, did it affect your sensibility in that sense? Um, in a way, but for this film, the, the conversations I had with Johan weren't really about 80s films so much as they were just about the sensations of being alive then or, you know, uh, moments that I remembered from, from, from growing up that felt or smelled even a certain way, that, you know, that we would talk about. And, uh, and textures, sonic textures, you know. Uh, we, we looked a lot more at, like, at, at, at rock music than we did at, uh, at film scores. I, it's funny, I, I remembered that I, I interviewed Johan about three years ago, and we were talking about the composer Vangelis and this resurgence of retro synth type scores, and yeah. Johan specifically pointed to Beyond the Black Rainbow as right. really helping start that trend. Yeah. So it's an interesting sort of uh, full circle that you worked together. Yeah. We're, we're both kind of fetishists, I think, in a way. And and we you know we were sort of like like talk a lot about specific th synth textures from 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 specific songs like specifically like there's this incredible sounding synth uh, kind of uh, texture in a film a song called S Sunday Afternoon in the Park by uh, Van Halen that's an instrumental song but it, it it's just this like there's something about that particular synth texture that just is like. It's it's like it's dark and it's erotic and it's it just it, it's and it's evocative and and you know we talked a lot about that synth. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a you had a sound in mind. What what why did you reach out to Johan? What why did you think he was the right guy for this? Well, to be honest, I didn't think of Johan. I, I thought of Johan. Johan was like number one. I thought he was out of my league. <laughs> And I thought, you know, I, I didn't know that he had interest in, 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 in metal and, 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 and the, these kind of things at all. So it, uh, it, it turned out that he knew Spectre Vision and he asked if, if what, what I was doing and, and if, he, if he could talk to me. And after talking to him for like, 
and you know, I don't go me wrong. I had the utmost admiration for him from a, from a distance. I just thought, you know, that that he, that uh, he, he, you know, this wasn't his cup of tea or whatever. From a distance, that was my my impression. But after talking to him for like 10, 15 minutes on the phone, I started to realize that a big part of him that, that maybe didn't get expressed in his scores was that he was an Icelandic metalhead and uh, <laughs> had great love for this kind of stuff. Just waiting for the right canvas to come along. Yeah. Kevin, uh, how long were you, or when did you become Johan's agent? Um, <clears throat> I started working with Johan uh, basically from the beginning. It was seven, seven years ago. Um, and uh, SpectreVision, when uh, Tim, who was another member at the time, uh, was, was managing Johan, he, um, he approached us about um, Johan, and that's how I first heard about him through his Fordlandia albums and his IBM um, uh, albums. And the, the second that I listened to it, I think I was probably an agent for about a week or two, and I, I ran down to one of my boss's office and said, oh my god, we need to sign this guy, he's, he's incredible. Um, and our first... Uh, project together was with actually Spectre Vision uh, before, uh, and we have the director right here actually, right? Oh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, actually that wasn't even with Spectre Vision, it was that just, it? it was Daniel and I, yeah, mechanic. Oh. Well, this, yeah. that was uh, the first project we did together, um, and then when Denny Villeneuve was looking for someone for Prisoners, he was a big fan of his, um, his album stuff, so it's, it's interesting that the, the first film I did with Johan was with Spectre Vision, and unfortunately, the last. Did it surprise you? I mean, was it was it obvious to you that this kind of thing would be right up his alley? Oh yeah, a lot of people don't know it, um, and getting to know his family a lot more too. Johan actually comes from a punk rock background. Uh, played in bands, played bass. Um, honestly, if if you talk to him about the theory of everything or the orchestral side of him, that actually came later in life. He started from a whole, you know, prog rock uh, metalhead background. And um, he he was such a great collaborator and a great producer and a great artist that I think that made it really well to transition then into uh, getting into the film scoring. So Johan always never wanted to repeat himself doing something the same. And uh, the truth is, is that he was a huge fan of, of Panos and, uh, the, your previous film and, and also uh, Spectre Vision, and he said to me, no matter what, we have to do this film. And I said, okay. Um, so uh, it, it was right up his alley, and he knew from the very beginning that he wanted to do this. So Panos, you, you had a sound in mind. You had these sort of, uh, did you reference any scores, or was it mostly in the kind of the metal, well, prog rock <clears throat> kind of vein? The only score that we really looked at was, um, the Flash Gordon Queen soundtrack, um, which uh, you know we both loved, and uh, and I, I don't know, I, I I wanted the film to have a kind of operatic rock, like in a rock opera kind of feeling to it. You know, it's not a it's not a, a, a musical, but I wanted it to feel like kind of like a like a Ken Russell musical, like a like a immersive kind of sonic, audio visual experience. Yeah, the music is in your face or in your ears it's it's really really it's not underscore it's right, right, yeah. overscore whatever yeah. um what so that's a that's a that's a choice that's a sensibility what what did you feel like the score was responsible for what what was what was not there in the film that the score needed to bring i don't know if i look at it that way um i feel like everything should be there in the film in a way uh, or you're not pulling it off but then then the score can add an, a completely new layer or enhance what's already there, or you know, uh, create like a halo around what's already there in a sense. Um, for me, a score is more textural, you know, more than than driving uh, emotion, or what I, you know, that's what I want a score to be in my films. It's more more like a like a like a, like a textural uh, dimension that lives in and amongst the images on the screen, but inescapable. In, in a way that right. we're not really used to in modern filmmaking. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I feel like, like these are kind of like rock operas in a way, you know? They're, they're just a purely sensorial experience that you have to give yourself over to, uh, or not. <laughs> <laughs> just to add to that, when he was first thinking of um, doing the project, I remember Johan said to me that he, he was looking at it like a rock band, um, and but more so that he wanted to map out the storytelling and figure out the ideas um, before he started getting into the textures of the sounds. But early on from the very beginning, he, he really um, 
I think was inspired by the conversations you guys had about some of those uh, uh, genres that you mentioned. But like Johan went in with every film, he always wanted to go at it with a different approach. So I think that's what came out of this on this one. And he, I mean, one thing that's so obvious about him is he just loved sonic exploration and air experimentation, which this seems like a great sandbox for that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Did Kevin, did he, do you remember anything specific about experiments he did or, or ways he sure. achieved so, some of the sounds in here? Um, well, in general, I think that Johan was um, always looking and searching for new sounds. And, you know, I think a lot of the composers these days are doing um, that as well. It's been around for years, is always trying to push the, the artistic, uh, artistic genre forward. And you hear it in his albums. And um, one of the things Johan used to say to me was that he likes to make your hair rise, whether it was an emotional cue or if it was a tension cue. And I remember you know, one time going to see his drone mass, and he said to me before, he said, you know, if it doesn't make your hair rise, then I didn't actually uh, make you feel something. And so when he was starting a project, he would always spend a lot of time gathering sounds and manipulating them. And he had some great team members that really um, helped him with taking so many recorded sounds and putting them into a system where he could actually you know, work with it. But um, on every project, he would never um, uh, start with anything that wasn't created already by him or, or sounds that he already had within his own library. On that note, that reminds me that uh, he, for the film, he went to a synth museum in Italy and they gave him access to all these incredibly rare uh, synthesizers so that they could go in there and, and sample uh, uh, elements from all of them. And I think he was planning on using some of the sounds for, for an album that he was in the, uh, working on as well. But I'm not sure if that's ever, if that's gonna come out or not. You tell me. But I, there's, I, I can't speak to what will and what won't come out in the future, um, but there is, there's a lot of material. Score also has a tender love theme. Say what? <laughs> there's, a, there's a beautiful love theme in here. Yeah, yeah. So it's not all raucous no. rock and roll. No. Um, were you, were you um, collaborating across continents uh, over the internet for the most part? Across continents, and yeah, it was, it was, it was mostly all done uh, it, you know, over the phone and Skype and electronically. But and did that make it? Was that difficult to to communicate that way? Uh, yeah, sometimes, but generally, no. I mean, our, just like with any composer, it was it was similar in that I would give give my thoughts and give my 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 requirements, and then they would generate stuff, and then we would talk about it. What you know, I felt what it needed, or what could be added, or their thoughts, and go from there. So, in this day and age, it honestly feels like. Like proximity is, is not no longer really an issue when it comes to certain uh, parts of the film. Did you get to spend much time with him in person? Uh, only a few days. Yeah. yeah. Was so he was sending you music and you were laying it against picture. Was there like a specific without giving any spoilers away? Uh, was there a specific scene or a specific piece that he sent you that that just made your hair stand up or you felt like you'd hit the jackpot with with what he was sending? Uh, most of it, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to pinpoint a specific. A specific do, do you have piece. favorite moments in the score, or just ones that really stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, I love, all, I love the entire score. I, I really feel like we're lucky, we're lucky to get them, and, uh, and, uh, I was very happy with the entire, uh, process and everything that, that Johan came up with in the, in the, at the end of the day, you know, it, uh, it was, a fulfilling experience to work with him, you know. Uh, I f I'm, so, you know, it's just I felt I, I really feel like we had just started started to work together, and I was looking forward to working with him again and, and kind of going into a, another level with him on uh, on something else. Yeah. And, and he actually finished finished the score before he died, or was there anything left un undone? It was completely f finished. Yeah. He I actually saw. It, I mean, it, he was alive when it premiered at Sundance and saw the the. The great reviews, but I, uh, for the soundtrack, um, Krang and Randall, I believe, uh, took the tracks and put it together for the actual soundtrack album. You guys will get later on. I said it's an interesting, it's an it's an interesting swan song, to, you know, just subject matter and and the the kind of movie it is. But the quality of the score, I think, is so so high, and it's really representative of of a lot of his things and his interests. And it's also just like I said, this canvas, this 
showcase for a score that most films aren't. And so it's sort of a gift. It's a gift to him, and it's sort of, you know, if, if people are going to remember him, they get to really remember him in this film because the score is just yeah, because, because so loud. And I mean, I'm big. glad that we were kind of there at that time to give him a, a you know, it's like a, a outlet for a certain part of him creatively that hadn't really been seen before. And so in that regard, you know, it's kind of a, a, a positive coincidence, you know. Have, have, has any response to the score, whether reviews or, or personal comments or anything, stood out to you the way people, any of you that you've noticed? I've definitely seen reviews, uh, you know, call out the score and, yeah. and praise yeah. the score. I yeah. just wondered if there was anything of note. It, it, it's okay it, if there's not. It's I nice that they it. mention it. Yeah. <laughs> that in and of itself is an accomplishment. When, this, when the film is getting such good reviews and they talk about how genius it all is, it's nice to see Johan get mentioned next to it. Yeah, and we've always, at Spectrovision, and, and th wh which is why Mandy kind of speaks to just our company as a whole, we've always been pushing for, you know, the, the film scores to... to uh, play a much bigger role in the overall vision of the film. And th there's a lot of filmmakers that think that they have to kind of like tuck the, the you know, the soundtrack. They have to like tuck it in there and kind of, you know, make sure that it's not, you know, apparent when you're in there. And otherwise it might take you out of the viewing experience. And I th we just feel that that's incorrect. Um, and so with, with Mandy, it's just, you know, the score plays such a, you know, prevalent role from beginning to end. Yeah, an another fan of yours, uh, from Black Rainbow anyway, is Clinton Mansell, the composer for a lot of Aronofsky's films. And uh, he, he, was, he gets frustrated with having to do that, with, be with the score being suppressed or making really conservative choices with the score. Well, it's just, I think that just speaks to the conservativeness of the industry right now, that they would even think that at all, you know? But you, you, you put this out there, it sa he said it sent him back to Kubrick, who did the same thing. It just made these unapologetic musical statements in his films uh, where the music isn't being subtle at all. It's, it's making a very provocative yeah. uh, contribution to the experience. Yeah. And there's something to be said for that. Yeah, well, I think that partly that might have something to do with a lot of the sort of uh, cre uh, ideas are generated when I'm listening to music, you know? And uh, so for me, it, it, I want the film to have that quality of this like very visceral musical visual combination, you know? Because when we listen to music, we, we want it to overwhelm us. Yeah. So why why not allow that to be part of the film? Yeah. Experience? Why not? Why not? Why, why is that wrong in the context of the film? It, it shouldn't be at all. Well, let's open and it I, up. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, no, please go. <laughs> no, that. <laughs> step on whatever you're about to say. Uh, let's open it up to some questions from the audience who has not seen the film or heard the score. <laughs> what did, imagine what the score sounded like, like he imagined those uh, VHS boxes and ask questions based on your imagination. <laughs> That's a fair request. Yes. <laughs> now that we've whetted your appetite. Yes, sir. Our goals are, are more, uh, our goals are just about, you know, trying to make films that, that we want to watch and support new voices that we feel are going unsupported in the industry. And that, that was our original intention. And now over the past few years, it seems that, you know, the industry is starting to catch up a little bit. And some of those, you know, unsupported voices are starting to lead the charge a little bit more, which is great. So. Um, I mean, we're always looking for things, you know, and it's like it's like falling in love. You just know it when you read it, you know. We don't we don't know what we're looking for, so they're not looking for composers for the room right now. So you know, <laughs> don't don't rush him. <laughs> uh, right, right up here. Yeah. The only one that I recognize by name from uh, was Stephen O'Malley from. Uh, uh, from a uh, Sano, Sano. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of people. And Randall, also for that Randall, matter. Dunn. Randall Dunn, yeah. Yeah, and let's see, let's, yeah, Pepin or yeah, Krang. 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 Uh, another composer that worked with him on this. Um, 
I think oh, that gosh. was like the core yeah, year. the core part of the, yeah, yeah, the team. Golden. I mean, he, he kept yeah. it pretty small, but I know Steph, Stephen and um, Randall were big parts. Yeah, and a lot of the musicians were, um, you know, like like Panos was saying, a lot of them were were musicians that Johan was like, no, 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 I need I need those specific guitar players that are in Argentina on that like little hidden cove along the, you know. And so there would be like all these little units all over the world just picking up sounds for him for this thing. It was pretty incredible. Uh, gentleman in the front. It was filmed in uh, uh, Belgium. And right behind you. It's funny you should say that because I actually think of him as an indie actor. <laughs> you know, from like the stuff that I grew up watching him in, like Birdie, the Alan Parker film, or, or Wild at Heart, or uh, Vampire's Kiss, you know, and then after that he did, you know, a bunch of studio movies. But uh, I think he responded to the material, you know. I think it's a, it was a rare film or that it was sort of uh, something that spoke to his own sensibilities and uh, a place where he could explore some of that in a way that's actually organic to the film, you know, and not feel, uh, I think a lot of directors are, not all, but a lot are scared of him, you know, and uh, they're, 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 I mean, when I say they're scared of him, I don't mean they, th they think he's an asshole. <laughs> I, th I, I mean that uh, they don't want him to be fully who he is as a, as a performer because they think it'll make their movie weird. But I think in this film, uh, it's sort of a, natural environment for him to sort of utilize the full range of his ability um, in a very, uh, I think, st striking way. Yeah, and I would say that that also, you know, that doesn't just mean his highs, that means his lows as well. Yeah. Like there's, there's sequences in the film that I adore where um, Nick, where the score is very quiet and soft and tender and it's just living on Nick for this long period of time as he experiences just sorrow. I think I found yeah, working yeah. with him that he's actually like an incredibly meticulous, modulated actor uh, who's hyper aware of what he has to achieve in a scene. And, and uh, it's, I, I was kind of in awe of his ability as an actor. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I don't really like to play music or have any sound when you're shooting. I, I, for me, like, I prefer silence. But uh, also, to play music during while you're filming, you need time to sort of be able to properly do something like that. And uh, on a low budget, on a, you don't really have uh, the time to be sort of experimenting with shit like that. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I, over, over the course of writing the film, I, I, I sort of put together like a playlist of, of songs that are inspiring me and kind of make like an unofficial, like, uh, you know, needle drop soundtrack. And I told Johan that, and so he, he immediately wanted to have that on hand for to sort of like sort of hear what I was thinking and you know, get a sense of what, what, what my, my inspirations had been. Um, but, you know, that was just purely, I think, you know, just a sort of like a sort of a conceptual starting point for him. I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, over there. Uh, this and Black Rainbow, I wrote a lot of it at night. I, I used to be very nocturnal, but now, you know, now I, I keep farmer's hours. I get, go to bed at 8 p.m. and uh, get up at like 6 a.m. But, uh, um, I, I was describing my process. I, I, I think the one word that it describes it, and I've been forced to figure out a word that describes it because of interviews, is uh, is iterative. In that, 
I, I, my goal isn't really to like, I don't think of a story and be like, I'm not going to sit down at a typewriter and tell this story. It's more conceptual. So uh, I'll think of it, become, I'll become sort of fixated on a genre or the way that a certain genre makes me feel. And then I'll start building a notebook around that and a notebook of ideas, a notebook of images, a notebook of songs, and sort of building almost like creating a, a, a kit bashing, a model kit. It feels, I, I feel like it's more like creating an object than, than, a, than, a, than a linear kind of story in a way. Um, um, ultimately, I want it to be effective as a story because I th it's almost like, a, it's like you're building like a custom car or something like that. And at the end of the day, you want to you want to drive it. You know, you don't want to just sit there in the on the lawn. You know, <laughs> you want it to move through space and time and make people feel th you know something. So, but the actual building, I feel like it's a little bit like you know, I'll come up with a title, I'll come up with a tagline, I'll make posters for it that you know that, that I don't that I don't show to anybody. So I feel it's almost a little bit like they used to in the seventies where, you know, like uh Samuel Z. Arkov or whatever would and, and American International would make a post they'd have a poster painted and then they'd write the script to the poster. <laughs> yeah. Uh I I can't really talk about that. Um Yeah. Yeah, it's right there. Uh, Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> I won't uh, belabor the foreplay anymore. I think you guys are all excited to uh, enter the s synthesizer nightmare that is Mandy. So thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the show.